listeners, and welcome to the NK News Podcast. I am your host, Jacko Zwetslut, and today it's the morning of Friday, the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, and I'm joined here in Seoul around the NK News Podcast table, possibly for the last time, because next year we'll be in uh, new digs. Joined by three members of the NK News team, James Fretwell, Collins Werko, and NK News and NK Pro founder and CEO, Chad O'Carroll. We're here to do an end-of-year look back and look forward. Before we get started, please re- leave a review about this podcast wherever you can, and that is so that people can discover our podcast more easily. We'll get new li- listeners that way. No reviews means that the all-powerful algorithm pushes us down the internet podcast rabbit hole into the abyss of ignorance, and no new people will ever listen to us again. So please do leave a review. And while you're at it, do share this episode with everyone you know and three people you don't. Secondly, do check out nknews.org and consider buying a subscription. If you get a yearly subscription, it is very affordable. It's only about a dollar a day, which is much less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee. Looking at James, who's having a Starbucks coffee. Thirdly, this is something I've never said before. This is to uh, Colin, who says, I always say the same thing at the start of every podcast. I've never said these words on the podcast before. Please follow all of us on Twitter. I don't believe I've ever said these words to anyone in real life or on the podcast, so mark this down in your history books. I'm a late comer uh, to Twitter, very skittish on the Twit machine. Uh, you'll find NK News at NK News, so that's easy. Chad O'Carroll is at Chad OCL. James Fretwell is at James Fretwell, where the L's are number ones. Is that because some other James Fretwell had already taken James Fretwell? James? That is absolutely true, and I have I have no idea who they are, but I, I you, must... You've never reached out to him to say, hi, I'm actually the real James <laughs> Fretwell. Is, is he or she, uh, are they making good use of their Twitter handle? You know, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to um, research that and, uh, and get back to you. I wonder if people write to people with the same name and say, look, you don't seem to be making much use of it. Why don't you sell it to me and I'll take it over? Well, uh, weirdly on Facebook, I do remember as a teenager, there was I, I got contacted by another James Fretswell who mm-hmm. had made a group of James Fretwells. Wow. So it does, oh, yeah, it I got does contacted happen. by yeah, a very James group. Fretwell kind yeah. of thing to do. Yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> no Jacko or Yoko group has ever reached out to contact me. So, you know, if you're out there, uh, Jackos or Yokos, uh, you know, I'm here. Uh, you can find me at Jacko Z, that's J-A-C-C-O-Z-E-D, or Z-E-D if you're American. Speaking of Americans, Collins Werko is at Collins Werko, which is Z-W-I-R-K-O. I think you said the, N- the NK News po- the NK News Twitter was yeah, it's, N- at it's, NK News, but it's at NK News Org. Yeah. Crap. Important Crikey. information. Yeah, that, no, that is a very important Dear information. Listeners. Look at that. On my, very fo- on my maiden Twitter broadcast, I gave the wrong Twitter handle. That is shocking. shocking. What is at NK News? At Good NK org. O-R-G. No, but... but what? <laughs> the original... <laughs> I don't, oh. I don't know. It's maybe someone KCNA have maybe grabbed it. Could it be a squatter, <laughs> a cyber, a, a Twitter squatter? Uh, now, anyway, I noticed that uh, in, in all this Twitter discussion, which we've never had before and hopefully never have again, I noticed that Colin is currently the only one of the four of us who has an all-powerful verified blue Twitter checkmark. I've tried <laughs> twice to get one, but have been summarily refused both times without explanation. Maybe if I get more followers, Colin, what's your secret? How did you do it? I don't know. I just thought it was something that I should do as a member of a news organization so i just tried and i got it i don't know awesome well you know i've chosen not to and i'm i'm, n- I'm never going to apply for one okay well i <laughs> I, I think that uh, just, just to when go I, against the grain for the sake of it <laughs> when i reach out making to me feel uh, embarrassed for it now, <laughs> you should be ashamed oh dear well i hope to be ashamed next year when i uh, apply for my third time uh, anyway, welcome back on the podcast, James, Chad, and Colin. Uh, we apologize to our listeners. We've got four men with very similar voices here. Uh, I must explain that I did send out an invitation to all NK News colleagues at the same time, and these three happen to have been the first to reply in the affirmative. It's not that we're opposed to uh, gender diversity at all. Yes. Great. So, uh, let us talk about uh, what we did this year. That's a bit of a a review episode. It's a little bit chaotic. I haven't got specific topics for each of you, just questions and and, and keywords. What has been your favorite NK-related story of the year? Who wants to kick that off? Uh, I, I'll start by maybe embarrassing Colin. Mm. Um, I think the uh, the the wrist watch uh, <laughs> watch story where uh, the Colin, wrist watch watch yes where Colin was tracking Kim Jong Un's weight by uh, looking at how, mm. how tightly the North Korean leader was uh, wearing his watch and that was great because uh, it was very creative of mm-hmm. you, Colin 
And uh, the world media picks up on that and it was really going viral. They were even using uh, the image that you created right in their in their news articles and uh you know it's, it was it was good fun to, to mm. see this uh kind of spread around the world and uh to be thinking yeah i'm sitting next to oh come on next okay, to stop, stop. the guy <laughs> no, I, I think i've that talked came about up this with the idea i think i've talked about this on the podcast before maybe um but, but not mean, everyone has heard that episode, so do, do uh, recap for us. And uh, I think it, it is testament to your... Right, uh, you do have a really good set of eyes, that you're good with uh, satellite photos and with noticing things, visual things, that not everyone picks up on, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, no, I mean, that was just... Um, you know, I saw that he had lost weight. Uh, that was obvious. People were, were kind of commenting about that on Twitter. So I thought it's not enough to just say that, Um anecdotally maybe so i thought just look for some sort of uh more empirical proof i guess right. uh so i just kind of threw that in there as a as a way to uh you know support the argument um but the argument of the story was not he lost weight the the argument of the the original story and we were the first ones to actually report that he lost weight back i i guess that was in june um that it was important because you know if he if that's a sign of some health problem, then that's something that uh, intelligence agencies need to know. And so I talked to, I talked to some people who said that that's exactly what they'd be looking for. Yeah, you know, is that a sign of some health issue? So that was the point, really. And um, yeah, throughout the rest of the year, you'll you'll find that now it's become a favorite of news, you know, less serious news organizations out there who will continue to write stories every time Kim Jong Un appears. That's the headline is. Uh, appears that Kim Jong Un lost weight. Like uh, I don't know, we we kind of passed that already. But right. But it is important to continue to watch out for little things here and there. And yeah, there were things throughout the year, uh, signs of health issues. You know, he was like standing on little padded mats, wearing weird uh, new comfort sandals instead of or, dress or shoes. shoes. Yeah, he had like a bandage on his head mm. on the back of his head at one point. Um, yeah, it, these things all point to. You know, something going uh well something strange with his his health and uh, also he wasn't really around that much this year he only showed up basically at political events uh he went he only left pyongyang once officially mm. uh satellite imagery looks like he spent a lot of time at his mansions he was building new mansions across the country he was demolishing mansions you know that's the life of Kim Jong Un. So. But you you say that the mansions are across the country but he only left pyongyang once officially so is that uh uh, can I infer from that that when he goes to these mansions, it's simply not reported on, but he is actually outside Pyongyang at that time? Yeah, we, we, we can't say that we have proof that he's there, but uh, by nature of North Korea, if, if uh, there are all these mansion compounds around the country, there's construction going on. That doesn't mean he's there if there's construction going on, but that means he ordered it for sure. Right. Uh, and when there's boat parties, when he's got his giant, you know, water slide boat hanging out at his 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 apparently his favorite mansion out on the on the east coast in Wonsan, yeah, that means he's probably there. And if he's not, it's his family enjoying themselves, you know, amid a food crisis and all this. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, other favorite uh, North Korea stories of the year? Can I jump in with one more? Is that okay? Sure. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> go on, go on, James. <laughs> Professor Andre Lankov's uh, recent article about how North Korea is going to go into an information dark age. Uh, as a historian myself by training, we, we do like our, our eras and our, and our periods. And yes. I think Andre, uh, Professor Lankov has um, probably correctly predicted, I, I think, the, uh, the next uh, or the current, the, the big development in, a, in North Korean history that we're going through. Of course, we're going to see more missiles um, over the next few years as well. But I, I think these uh, these border closures, the lack of information coming out, I think that's something that uh, in the decades to come, we're going to look back at uh, what's going on now and that might be uh, how we remember this time. Now, North Korea has never been in a, uh, an, inform an information bright age. Uh, <laughs> so it's the border closures here that are adding an extra layer of darkness, yes. is it? Is that, yeah, information, darker information, dark age. Okay. Yeah, would be a better way darker to describe age. it. Darker yeah. age, yeah. But I'd say that <clears throat> this kind of ties into what um, I've really enjoyed doing this year, which is due to the what's going on in North Korea, the lack of access, the diminishing sources... I mean, you, you guys remember this all started last year with our trip to Yunpyongdo, the island that was shelled by North Korea, but I've got quite addicted to uh, 
going to the border yeah. now and have we've we've done various trips to like the east coast to uh uh new spots that have opened up um just uh near kimpo um going out to kangado and it's um you know it's limited what you can see but um i had never really for some reason i would never been that curious about doing that from south korea uh because i just assumed you're just gonna see some show village or something along those lines but we've um you know it, it's like not super exciting stuff, but it's really interesting for people like us to just to to take the zoom lens and like peer into a village and just see people um, getting around with their their daily activities, moving things, and and you know, I mean, there was a time that those kind of photos we'd put the, put them online on the website and it wouldn't really get much response, mm. but done it a couple of times this year and it got actually quite um, you know quite a lot of traffic, which I think also t- you know. Uh, in it underscores the fact that there is just really little information and there's like an appetite for stuff that can come out um it's hard to know like you know there are limited places you can go to and and we we've gone to most of them but there you know there's still a few I'd like to go to in the new year Pyongyangdo the mm. um, the larger of the two islands that near North Korea so maybe we'll plan a field trip that does and, require uh, quite a bit of uh, planning, doesn't it? You've yeah. got to catch that ferry two super days, early in the morning. We need to go for two days, yeah. basically, but it'd be fun. Uh, speaking of uh, stories that have, have uh, attracted traffic from readers, uh, do we know what the most popular stories of the year have been, Chad? Uh, yes, we do. I don't have those statistics in front of me um, right now, um, but I can... I can come back to that later on in the yeah. episode then. Chad, is there any way that we can know what the most popular stories with readers were this year? Yep, I'm just looking at Google Analytics now. Number one, Kim Jong-un's wife has been missing from the public eye for more than a year. I think that was Colin. Is that a Colin story? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, Number two, Colin wrote this, mysterious spot and bandage appears on the back of Kim Jong-un's head. That is a Colin story. Yeah, which if you want to know, I mean, that that, if you want to know an update on that, that was Mm. just... uh, some kind of splotch. It was like kind of green colored on the back of his head, kind of under where his hair would be. Yeah. Uh, at the, the base of the skull. Is that where that would be? And um, uh, it doesn't look like it's anything more than some kind of skin issue. Okay. So, so who knows? Hmm. You know, there's a bit of a trend here. I'll just read through a few more of these. Kim Jong-un looks thinner and intelligence agencies are likely paying attention. Everyone in North Korea is talking about emaciated Kim Jong-un, state media, which was a really interesting story because state media actually mm. commented on it through an, in- an interview. Uh, DPRK imports from China collapse amid uh, China uh, signs of food crisis. Yeah, uh, there's, there's an ask a North Korean on uh, what do North Koreans typically eat. This is a, the trend here is food, food shortages mm. and leadership, basically. Right. Um, yeah, and then you go further down. Once lush uh, supermarkets are now barren and deceptive in North Korea. Um, oh, and North Korean defector Yonmi Park models human rights message with partisanship. That was an op-ed by John Lee, who um, I think was uh, quite critical of 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 the way that um, Yonmi Park has described some human rights abuses in North Korea, and and uh, maybe mix that with. Um, U.S. domestic political uh, advocacy. Is uh, that John Lee, the Korean foreigner? Yes, John Lee, the Korean foreigner. Mm. Who, um, yeah, he, he writes solid columns. Um, so yeah, that that seems to be the theme of the year, the popularity. And right. uh, we must say, Collins, Colin Zverko actually wrote a lot of these. So and I noticed this morning that the most popular story trending right now on the website is a story by Colin published just this week about a new Twitter account from North Korea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want me to yeah tell us a little bit about, about that it's just uh the north korea has had this sort of twitter slash youtube slash weibo which is the chinese social media network uh strategy uh, propaganda campaign going on since about 2018 mm-hmm. uh, it's all run by a company called sogwang media company at least it was at the beginning who knows if like they've been taken over or changed because the sogwang right. website is actually down ah. for now, over wait, wait, a year now but a background here sogwang is that not uh, run by the wife of the current DPRK ambassador to China, or have I got my stories mixed up? Uh, yes, that is that is true. Okay. Yeah, uh, I talked to her on the phone uh, about a year ago, and she confirmed some information at the time about uh, how they're connected to KCNA. They're actually in a building that's physically connected to KCNA in Pyongyang. Mm. Uh, and so, so is AP News? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So it's a little different, but <clears throat> yes. <laughs> uh, so obviously, this is a propaganda campaign or operation that is approved at the highest levels in North Korea. It's mm-hmm. run out of North Korea, and it's just you know photos and positive messages about North Korea in English and Chinese to right. the outside world. <clears throat> so. Uh, they've been deleted and suspended from Twitter and YouTube many times, but they keep coming back. So they have a new account that just popped up in the last couple of months, and they're trying to put the personalized spin on it with these vloggers, uh, usually like young women mm-hmm. and some young men. For yeah. a while there, uh, it was uh, Una was the number one vlogger, uh, but now I believe it's, uh, is it Jonghee? Have I got her name right? Uh, Jinhee. Jinhee. Jin- Jin- yeah. Yep. So... Yeah, it was this girl named Anna, and uh, she disappeared at the end of 2020. Uh, you know, maybe she got fired, or who knows. Her last happened. video was was criticizing YouTube, right? Uh, yeah, it was something strange about how she actually actively came out and made a video very personal about, like, mm. you know, how dare, you know, Google is uh, trying to take us down, something like that. I, I'm paraphrasing, but um, yeah, so it's just a. Uh, there, the point of my article this week is just they're they're continuing this campaign of positive messages in English and Chinese, but they're not changing their propaganda strategy at all. It's just very uh, typical North Korean propaganda, a little bit, you know, not being creative or innovative, uh, at least anymore. It kind of was at the beginning. Yeah, it was. I mean, even some of the early uh, Jinhee videos, it was less propaganda and it was more like, let's go and visit a restaurant and, or let's uh, yeah, it's walk, like tourist through, videos, a, walk you know. through an autumnal park and talk about my mother or something. You know, Are they still making content in Russian? Because I think that's how she started doing... Uh, yeah, she was speaking Russian, now she's speaking Chinese and English in her videos and I haven't seen a Russian language video, so maybe they figured out that's not a target market they really need mm. to worry about anymore. But um, yeah, I mean, Kim Jong-un said at the, at the Congress last january that the the for the external information sector needs to up their game basically and it doesn't seem like they really are hmm. not that you know they need to but right uh yeah. from my personal opinion yeah um anyone got a, a favorite north korea based book or documentary that they've uh, encountered in the last year it doesn't have to be a new one just something that you've encountered in the last year yeah, I <clears throat> I watched um, a Channel Four News, which is a British network. It was actually something filmed back in 2018 that I'd overlooked. Um, and while the summits were going on, they sent a crew to South Korea and basically um, followed several defectors around and documented their experience of trying to remit money, trying to call home, mm. and. Um, I don't know. Well, it was the first time I I think I'd actually really seen something that just focused on that. And what struck me was just how, you know, how difficult it seems to be getting. And like to send money and make phone calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was back then, 2018. Yeah, that was well before the pandemic. Gosh, doing calls. You know, they were they had they managed to tape one with someone's like family member. He had to go up on a hill like multiple times uh they missed a hill the, in north Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah they missed the call and and then even when he was on the phone he was like really stressing like, i, I right. have to end this call like within three or four minutes people are watching and um you know we know that this problem has got significantly worse since covid hmm. and uh yeah it just I right, to be honest it just makes me increasingly skeptical of those um who continue to um, claim an ability to do this uh, multiple times a day because right. a lot of very serious people that work in human rights and amongst defectors are saying it's getting much, much harder. So I don't see how mm. that, and it's, you know, it's certainly got harder for us to move information. And so I don't understand how, um, how some organizations on the surface are not being affected by this, but... And is it generally uh, people using Chinese phones and Chinese phone networks? Is that how yeah, it works? You, you yeah. need a Chinese phone on the North Korean side of the border and um, you can basically dial that Chinese number from South Korea and get through. But the thing in the documentary was like they were just getting uh, the phone switched off um, message right. most of the time because the, 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 the signal is so patchy that mm. the calls just can't connect a lot of the time. Uh, so, you know, that was back then and we we've read reports of north korea increasing its surveillance increasing i mean yeah andre's andre lankov's article touches upon this we know physically defector numbers are massively down Mm. so there is clearly evident like the data shows there is definitely a problem here right in in getting people out 
Um, and I would argue that that logically must extend to information as well. So yeah, it's um, that was a really interesting documentary, and it would be, mm. it'd be I think it would be really interesting if someone did an update on that and actually took a deep dive into documenting uh, how defectors are are finding things right now. Right. Um, Do you remember the title of this? Uh I don't remember Channel it, 4 but it, you can find it on the internet maybe Dispatches yeah uh, I think it was Dispatches if the if doubt is starting to come up a bit uh, and it seems like it has uh, in terms of how these uh, organizations get their information they, that might uh, tip the scale in terms of a motivation to show a little bit of it I would think so maybe there's a chance that they would cooperate with some film crews I mean you know they'd want to uh, you know regain some trust I think yeah. they'd be, but they'd want to be very secret at the sa- secretive at the same time. I mean the, the defective how networks. they're no 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 I mean the uh you know the organizations which continue to claim that they are in ah. constant contact with North Koreans mm. via phone you know it'd be interesting. Now I know years ago uh, a friend of mine was traveling in North Korea came down to to Panmunjom on the northern side and he had his South Korean phone with him and was able to get on the South Korean network in Panmunjom because it was you know close enough are there any confirmed reports of uh, of people using the south korean network to contact north koreans very very close to the border say either in kangwon province or in kyonggi province yeah that's an interesting question uh i don't know i've not heard any but you know one thing i always do when i go to the 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 border and I always send my results of this experiment to Martin Williams of North Korea Tech. Is I I go onto my phone settings and do a network scan mm. to try and look for North Korean signal. Sure, and uh, I never ever get it. Like ah. it's it's because yeah, you're right. You can get the south the South Korean signal in uh, quite a few parts of the the, the the deep south of North Korea. Yeah, but it appears they they seem to cut their signal short a bit. So mm. maybe it doesn't fully reach the border, and it's probably due to you know concern that, that there may be some way of uh, South Korea hacking into it and getting. Are you sure that's not uh, built into so- you know South Korean phones are legally required to do all sorts of stuff? No, no, mm. I have an international phone and it works oh, okay. in North Korea and okay. you know can pick up the signal. Uh, that I do remember that the, I inter- interviewed the Air Cor- uh, Coriolink technical director, an Egyptian guy who quit his post in 2013 and uh, I interviewed him in 2015. I, th- I seem to remember him saying that there was some deliberate um, uh, blocking or, or boosting of some signals around borders to prevent uh, any bleed over, mm. uh, which may be what we're seeing. And the North Koreans probably have more reason to be quite strong about this. But um, yeah. Mm. Got it. Okay. I, I have an answer to the, the documentary or whatever. Yeah, it's favorite yeah, I, book or documentary, yeah. Well, I've just been watching more videos that come out, that keep coming out on YouTube from the Ar- Aramaki Project. Aramaki Project, it's this guy, uh, I believe Oliver wrote about this a couple of years ago. Um, our former colleague, Oliver Yeah, Hoffer. yeah. and he, I think he might have gotten help from our current colleague, Oliver, or you know, I might be confusing which one wrote. Anyway, uh, it's, it's this uh, Japanese man who for years, you know, ever since the 90s, I think, or mm. maybe the early 2000s, was taking camcorder videos that are... So if you enjoy kind of the raw footage, you know, these days on YouTube, uh, walking tours of cities are very popular. So right. it's, it's like that, but filmed in the 2000s Pyongyang or uh-huh. all around North Korea. And they're very interesting videos. Usually wow. they're like 10 minutes long. And it's just, you know, him walking around the streets, zooming in on people, you know, going about their daily lives. Uh, so it's it's it's... It's really interesting to kind of step back in time. Some of them are more recent, you know, like since 2015, 16. So, what, was he in yeah. there as a tourist? Yeah, I think he's he. Uh, I f- you know, it's all in the article um, yeah. because they interview him. Okay, I forgot exactly the details of of how he gets such access, but mm. I think he's with uh, maybe I don't know Chung, um, Chung Japanese Young. Association people. I, I don't know, but uh, good access. Anyway, they're very interesting, and mm. it's a raw look at North Korea. Um, I like that kind of thing. So Aramaki. Less polished. Yeah, Aramaki Project. Yeah. Okay, something to look for there on they the They keep YouTube. coming out. You know, the videos keep coming out. So. Oh, great. As they become digitized and re-edited, I right, suppose. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, all right. Uh, James, any favorite book or uh, documentary this year? I'm going to cheat a little bit and turn this into a film uh, okay. and, and drama as well. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, South Korean movies mm. and dramas. Uh, early this year, the movie Fighter 
Korean name Paito mm -hmm. uh, came out. So that's about a North Korean defector adjusting to life in South Korea and um, finds uh, kind of her, her place in South Korean society. Oh, it's through, a woman. Through, yes, mm -hmm. uh, through um, training to be a boxer. And um, of course, there is the uh, the real life uh, North Korean defector boxing mm. champion mm. Uh, Trey Hyun Mi. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it was a fantastic movie. Uh, unfortunately, the the theater was pretty empty when mm. when I saw it, which is a which is a big shame. Is that a um, function of COVID or a function of the movie not being as popular as it should be? Well, I I also saw Spider Man uh, recently, and that theater was pretty full. So I I think it's a <laughs> hmm. I think it's a not a COVID thing necessarily. Okay. But that was a really terrific movie, and of course, uh, you know, kind of a metaphor, right, for for defectors. Uh, lives in general, you've got to be a, a fighter, mm. um, not yeah. necessarily literally, but also uh, metaphorically. Um, and also DP, which, I mean, it isn't about North Korea, Deserter Pursuits, which is a, a Netflix drama this year, um, about the, the real life um, part of the South Korean military that uh, tracks down right. uh, runaways from the uh, the South Korean military because all men in it, uh, uh, here have to uh, do military service yeah. um, for around two years and um, it was uh, it, it it detailed some of the it, uh, sympathetically sometimes of uh, some of the reasons why these mm. people uh, decided to run away from the South Korean military and uh, interestingly North Korean media also. Uh, someone in North Korea watched watched this drama, and uh, there was criticism from North Korea of this shows, uh, you know how how awful life in the South Korean military is. But presumably that's on Uri Minjokiri, which is the North Korean propaganda site for South Koreans. Something like this, yeah, but like external media. I mean, I this is I mean that in itself isn't something particularly new for North Korea. They're always uh, looking at things in South Korea, and mm. even, even I think even Squid Game they were looking at right and saying you know uh this shows south korea is is a horrible place um i think the interesting thing about dp is that it is somewhat based on uh on reality and um it, it does make me wonder that you know most north korean propaganda probably wouldn't have much of an effect if if south koreans could have uh ready access to it mm. um but sometimes you do come across reports like this, and I I did wonder, you know, if if uh, if lots of South Koreans could read this this kind of criticism, um, that uh, you know, would what kind of effects would would this have? What are you talking about? Like military readiness, South Korean military? Is that the point? No, no, no. About um, you know, these these people are running away from the South Korean military because of uh, bullying, hazing, bullying. Yeah. So uh, meaning, you know, it's it's a it's if we're talking about North Korea, it's a view on how they would uh, how ready the South Korean military is, how how oh, no, passionate. No, 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 no. Do you, I just, mean, uh, just about uh, if you're um, doing your obligatory um, uh, military service in South Korea, how how tough it can be, and how poorly the the um, the, the men in the military are treated. Mm. And this this is a reflection of, of South Korean society and and why you know eventually we I'm should sure all those, unite under the yeah I'm sure those problems Kim probably also exist in North Korea right? oh I'm sure yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not denying that yeah. but um, yeah the show would have been more interesting maybe if it was a North Korean DP I mm. thought it was too short it's only six episodes and it yeah I was just a bit underwhelmed by it I honest. haven't watched it yet so I'll have to get that one Squid over Squid Game uh, on the other yeah. hand the yeah. effects have played a role in that mm. and, uh, yeah, if you quite... want to talk about South Korean society watch <laughs> Hellbound eh oh, oh, yeah, Hellbound. Yes. I'm, I'm watching that right now it's uh, yeah it's pretty full on <laughs> I've got the, uh, the comic books after watching the show uh, okay next question who is your um, favourite North Korea expert who doesn't yet write for NK News or NK Pro who's, who's put out some really good content this year Whose website or uh, blog or or, or uh, op-eds do you follow? Yeah, I would say Brian Myers. Uh, he has contributed one or two mm -hmm. columns to us over the years, and I often email him. He's very polite, but yep. he always he always rejects me. <laughs> he does write um, some very interesting stuff on his. Uh, we don't we can't call it a blog, but it's it's a it's a website. Uh, Steel Ste Press. Steel, Steel Press. Yeah. S Good stuff. H E L E. Yeah, press. he's dot com. He's uh, I, I don't always agree with him, but uh, you know he writes um, you know well argumented and yep. uh, structured 
commentaries about mm. uh south korea north korea um and uh yeah i think i think it's you know he's a really important voice and uh right. i i like the fact what he does is different mm. um you know when you read the the beltway think tanks yep. and you can just predict often what they're going to say and it's to be honest i, I wouldn't I, I don't use my time reading a lot a lot of these materials mm. um but his blog i do read regularly um can't call it a blog uh so yeah mr myers professor yeah. myers if you're listening yeah um, it's thoughtful it's thought provoking and if you are listening we do welcome you, you on uh, the podcast anytime uh you know we have an open invitation <laughs> for you to come on i've interviewed him a couple of times on um the kei podcast when i was a uh, host of that they, they were really great interviews um yeah so uh yeah um he would be one person that comes to mind from from my side okay any other uh, good writers who don't yet work with us no all right um what about most overlooked nk uh north korea related article this year what's you know something that you thought was important but didn't get as much uh, traction or pickup as you thought it should have oh yeah that, that definitely for us well for me we uh would have been there was a a, a ship sanctioned by the united nations mm. that um docked in pusan yeah. south korean authorities um i think f uh basically took a a sort of um, penalty action towards the vessel and the crew, and said, "You can't leave. You can't dock. Uh, just, just be uh, anchored out of out of Pusan." And we sent uh, Wong Yi and Jong Min down to Pusan to to uh, uh, film it using our a long lens. Mm. And um, what was interesting is the South Koreans, had, the government, had not revealed that they had basically seized this sanctioned ship that had a, a previous record delivering oil indirectly to north korea they didn't mention it no foreign ministry statements and they, this is all around the time that um uh, i think moon was doing the letters to kim jong-un mm. and they were they were rebuilding trust and and momentum to get the inter-korean hotlines back and that story we published it we had great video photos mm just completely you know tumbleweeds disappear and um yeah. usually nope. usually the conservative south korean press would have been on a story like right. that right uh because it's just um you know it, it, it can be used to bash the government in some way or like undermine that those sprouts of outreach towards kim jong-un look it's two-faced they're actually seizing vessels connected to north korea at the same now, time just remind uh, us the uh what actually is the connection it was a ship north korean owned or were there no north no, korean no, no crew no. on it or no no so yeah it, it was a uh, un designated uh ship and it had been caught red-handed delivering oil via ship to ship transfer mm -hmm. uh some years ago actually to a north korean vessel which then went back to uh, nampo and mm. delivered the oil um and it yeah i think it, there was a, a cluster of these vessels that were connected in one way or another that had done this on a, on several occasions right. on the flip side you know that stuff did happen a few years ago and the un designations linger they just it's very hard for them to disappear so maybe that's why it didn't get much interest but you know for us i think i was just most surprised that south korean media totally mm. overlooked that because yeah it's usually donga or choson would would love a piece like that Wait. In, in the same way that uh, South Korean media and, and the world, I think, uh, ignored uh, when the USS Pueblo was sailed around or brought <laughs> around from the East Coast to the West Coast back in the early 2000s, right? Uh, nobody seemed to pick up on that. And then suddenly there it is in Pyongyang on display. Yeah, yeah, that was... I, I, I'd heard rumors as well that it could have been done by land, but that doesn't seem feasible. Mm. What happens normally to the crew in such a situation? Not the Pueblo, but back to the uh, the US sank sorry UN think, sanctioned yeah, ship. Are I they think, just forced to stay there? I think they were a Mongolian crew, and they just have to to sit on the the ship and await further action. I don't know what. So it would actually be interesting to find out what happened to that vessel. Right, because it could still be there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's probably still seized by South Korea, um, unless something has happened. The uh, I, I'm thinking of the the case in Lebanon. That ship that brought. Uh, highly explosive fertilizer to uh, to Lebanon which blew up last year. Oh yeah. Uh that crew was kept in that ship uh on at port for a, a good 6 months before they were allowed to go eventually. Yeah. So th sometimes that happens the crew are the one left on the hook for the owner of the ship who doesn't pay the fines or doesn't go to court or doesn't you know negotiate for the release and the crew are just sort of left there holding the baby in the form of a yeah. giant ship. 
the other the other thing i think um which um our colleague nils has really uh i think done some pioneering work on in the last year uh cyber uh cyber attacks by north korea mm. are you know I, I think we're only scraping the surface in terms of what we know and that this is basically already a huge area of activity but it, that is significantly overlooked by um un panel of experts you know the the section on cyber is usually just a few paragraphs mm. by uh mainstream press yeah um we just hear about you know that oh, of course there was jean lee uh, um she did the right, great the lazarus heist podcast, great podcast series mm. lazarus heist um but yeah like this there's, there's so much more activity in that area and yeah i think we really are scratching the surface and uh, and it's only going to grow isn't it the uh, north korean cyber uh, activity yeah. i mean as nils points out that Typically, if, if the U.S. was committing uh, cyber mm. attacks on Russia or China, for example, the, the, re the, the deterrence that China has over the U.S. to prevent them doing that is that the U.S. has what's called a, lar a very large attack surface. In, in other words, all those uh, American power stations, TV companies, hospitals, police systems are vulnerable by dint of being connected to the World Wide Web in one right. way. North Korea's attack surface is incredibly small. Mm. So they have very little to lose from all of this and they're already sanctioned to the teeth. So what do what, what options do policymakers mm -hmm. really have if North Korea massively ramps up activity and theft in this area? I mean, what can they really do? Mm. And also uh, governments who are familiar with this are reluctant to share the detail of what they know because it can reveal um, the very expensive systems and technologies that they've built right. up um, sometimes domestically to, to detect these things. So, yeah, it's a bit of a catch-22. Okay. Uh, Colin, uh, James, any other story that you thought was uh, overlooked this year that didn't get enough play? Yeah, I've got a, well, I've got a couple. Uh, just quickly, mm. one I've, that I did earlier in the year, I think both are going to be my stories, but... Um, uh, it didn't get noticed that much. I wrote about how there are these red, these large red propaganda monuments in front of you know a lot of factories, businesses all over North Korea, all over North Korea. Uh, big red flags in brick or stone, and mm -hmm. then they have a slogan on it. And for decades, these slogans have referred to either Kim Jong Il or like follow Kim Jong Il to the end of the earth, basically. Yep. And then they all switched to say, follow Kim Jong-un to the end of the earth mm. um, during Kim Jong-un's era. But at the beginning of the year, suddenly in the course of like a month, they were all changed to say, which means follow, yeah, follow the party central committee to the end of the earth. Um, so it's part of, to me, it's part of this uh, dual track uh, under Kim Jong-un where he's boosting his cult of personality still mm -hmm. today. But at the same time, boosting the institutionalism of the party. So meeting, you know, people all around the country when they go into their factory now is the sign that says follow the party central committee. Um, so it's a less mm. less cult of personality in that sense. But right. it's a little bit confusing. Maybe that's why people didn't pick up on it, because it's not like Kim Jong un propaganda has been diminished at all. So right. Um, I wonder what Chris Green yeah. would make of that. He's always, uh, you know, institutions and institutionalization. Wouldn't surprise him. <laughs> no, he wouldn't be surprised. No. And then the other one, which is also a little bit of a mystery, is in June at the there was a plenum, and uh, state media like the Rodong Shinmun print media they all wrote uh, one thing about the what they decided, and then KCTV, the state TV, came out and said that the agenda item actually said explicitly that there is an urgent food crisis, mm. which is a, a terminology that they do not use in North Korea to refer to themselves really ever. Right. They're always talking about uh, other countries. Uh, and it said that they were urgently trying to solve this by opening up uh, food reserves and, and restarting distribution of food and said, everyone, please wait till we fix this for you, right? Mm. And so there was this big discrepancy. And uh I thought it was really strange and kind of um, shameful that ev all these media companies are still, to this day, referring to that plenum uh, something less impactful that Kim Jong-un said just because right. they don't pay attention to KCTV. So ah. um, it's a weird discrepancy. I have no idea why KCTV was given the authority to mm. be more uh, open and explicit about this because print media absolutely covered it up. Absolutely. Um, so it's That's very strange. Yeah. Um, okay, what about favorite, or maybe favorite is perhaps the wrong word, but uh, 
Most interesting North Korea focused rumor that turned out to be true this year. Anything? I was thinking, oh, were there any rumors this year that I don't mm. know if there really were. Well, well, there are ones we can't prove, prove one way or the other, all seemingly from Radio Free Asia in recent weeks. Oh, like the Squid Game stuff. Squid Games, trench coats, no laughter. Um, yeah. Oh, was it was the no laughter thing a Radio Free Asia uh, so single source story too? But, but that one, Colin made a good point. I mean, you can explain. Yeah. Uh, the that's probably the likeliest to be true of those three. Mm -hmm. I'd say it depends. On, I mean, I've always said whenever you read uh, Daily NK, RFA, Asia Press. Uh, there is, there has been, there have been stories that have been proven correct. There have been stories that have been proven wrong. Um, they're dealing with single source anonymous and usually through, uh, like a game of telephone. They're not always talking to the person who witnessed something. Right. So, uh, it's, you always have to kind of, uh, take the big picture from these stories. And with the RFA, no laugh, the story is the Kim Jong-il mourning period starting from December 17th, which was the 10 year anniversary of Kim Jong-il's death just, uh, about a week ago. Uh, from that day, they would have a mourning period for at least, I don't know, what was the story? But there were a lot of details in the story, like no laughing in public, no uh, drinking, no partying, something like that. And it got a lot of criticism because it's RFA and they've been, you know, there was the Squid Game thing mm -hmm. from uh, a month ago. And Chad wrote a pretty good story on the on the Squid Game. You know, how to think deeply about it is the point instead of just taking it on its surface. Um, so with the laughter thing and, you know, uh, Chad's written a story before about how... Uh, people have refrained from drinking alcohol when Kim Jong-un leaves the country. Uh, or um, I think there have been stories in the past about um, you're not allowed to drink alcohol during mourning periods. Um, but I think it's just there's nuance to it. I think it's it's fair to expect that they would deliver messages through organizations around the country like don't uh, be um, parting or making, uh, don't be too joyous right now it, on the 10th year, on the 10-year yeah. anniversary of Kim Jong-un's death. Sure. But even state media is showing children laughing, mm. you know, in the in the days after that apparent order. Right. So um, it's not like state TV is trying to uh, hold a certain atmosphere because they're playing all sorts. You know, they're playing sports. They're playing right. fun kids cartoons. Um, you know, but I would still expect there to be some grain of truth to you know, don't be yeah. overly. Yeah, when it was uh, Kim Jong Un leaving for the summit with Trump on a couple occasions, I we we heard from. Uh, various sources, diplomats, aid workers, tra uh, travel industry people, that their North Korean partners, yeah, had had revealed, and they can't drink, or yeah, they were really being told to like just tone everything down while Kim is out of the country. Right. Uh, someone described it as like the father is out of the house, mm. so we have to wait until he gets back before we can have any fun. Yeah. In my world, you'd have the fun while the father's out of the house, but. <laughs> <laughs> While the uh, the cat's away, yeah. uh, Chad, wasn't there a, a time about ten years ago when uh, Kim Jong Il died when you were thinking of closing down NK News? Yeah, yeah, I tweeted about this the other day. Basically, I I, I didn't really start the website up to be a, a what it is today. Mm. It was just uh, really a, a a blog kind of project just to have on my CV, and it was around like yes, yeah, just uh, October twenty eleven. You know, the traffic was pretty crappy. It was like 300 hits a day or something. And I was just like, where am I going with this? Mm. Um, no, nothing exciting is happening. And then, yeah, uh, Kim Jong-il died. And I just thought, okay, actually, I, mean, I saw an instant bo boost of traffic, even though I hadn't done any stories yeah. or blogs about Kim Jong-il dying. Um, and and uh, yeah, just that, I, it was a pretty decisive moment mm. in, whether or not the the website keeps going or not, so a decisive moment for both North Korea and for NK News. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, around that time, also around that time in December 2011, uh, Victor Cha, uh, who we've not yet had on the podcast, he wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times in which he argued that North Korea was finished uh, and that it would come apart in weeks, maybe months, uh, perhaps to become the next Chinese province. Now, that prediction, like so many about North Korea over the years, hasn't aged particularly well. Uh, so it's time to make some predictions here that won't age well. So I have prepared <laughs> uh, four cards and four pens. I'm going to hand them out now. There you go. And so we don't influ you. influence each other's answers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do is I want each of us to, uh, to write down something very specific that may happen in the next... Tw uh, so not between... 
January 1st, 2022, and December 31st, 2022. So it's a prediction for 2022. We'll, and then we'll put 10,000 won into a pot, and whoever's prediction comes true will get the, uh, the 40,000 won. Uh, if more than one becomes true, then the pot is split. And if none comes true, then we donate the money to a charity nominated by Chad. Uh, and a year from now, we'll come back and read these predictions uh, on the air again. Now, the only uh, rule is it, it must be something specific. It can't be something boring like North Korea will open its borders. Uh, and no uh, predicting someone's death, please, because that's a bit tasteless. And make sure to write your name on the card. Okay, if you're done, please hand your card back to me. Hand your card back. <laughs> Colin's breaking down. <laughs> I mean, I have something like quite boring. So, I mean, are we supposed to make it fun or exciting? It doesn't have to be fun. It, it just uh, at least more interesting than North Korea won't open its borders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think, you know, is something going to happen with the population? I mean, are they going to be just as, uh, are they just going to, are they going to live the same, you know, compliant life for the next 10 years that they did for the last 10 years? And the last Don't 70 me. years, you know, that's what I wonder, but that's too bold of a, of a prediction to say that anything's going to happen. All right, well, just finish what you got there. Some very interesting things here so far. <laughs> of course, we, uh, South Korea will have a, uh, a new president uh, in the next year. That's going to be interesting to see how he or she uh, takes care of the North Korea situation. All okay, right, number two is, is more fun. Okay. Right. Number well, one is, is more game. immediate. Number two is more uh, long-term. This okay, is going to be in the next, you know, the, the 20 years since uh, the Kim Jong-un podcast when you'll invite us all back and say, James, uh, do you remember uh, 10 years ago when you told me that uh, well, exa- this actually, happened? How wrong you were. Uh, Chad, do you, th- do you see yourself uh, in 2031 uh, still running NK News? Yeah, 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 100%. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the predictions here. I'm going to re- read them out now for our audience. Uh, Colin, uh, satellite launch before another ICBM launch. Uh, that's, he's actually got two predictions. The second one, North Korea will open intranet social media app or dating app. That's an interesting, that's it. I like that. Mm. Okay, uh, James, no end of war declaration by the end of Moon's term, which is... Um, Early May, I think, he sta- is, is the inauguration of the next president, right? So Really putting your neck out on that, that one. That's, that's a little bit of a no-brainer, yeah. <laughs> Gee, I don't think that's very dangerous. Okay, uh, Chad, in 2022, China threatens to withdraw from the UN panel of experts. To, no, withdraw support for it, because it's a UN, uh, it has a uh, mandate ah, that sorry. has to be renewed every year. Withdraw support. Yeah. From, uh, and myself, North Korea will start live-streaming its propaganda on the internet. Mm. Live streaming. Live streaming. Mm. So we'll start seeing things maybe from a parade or an event. We'll see some live streaming rather than waiting until the day later to uh, to show. They've parades. already shown some stuff live before. Not that not that rare. Wasn't it the weather last year, Colin? Yeah, they did a weather, but well, that was more like real time, not. Really but they live. don't. They don't but, actually. But with a narration off. though, like a, a vlogger or somebody saying, "And here we have, you know, the missiles coming down the." Uh, and they the don't street. have a. They don't have a live copious. stream website. It's all through state TV, which is a chore to mm. receive if you're not um, in the media. So that's uh, that was, will be an interesting one. Yes, oh, that's where we're going to wrap it up for this end of year podcast to our audience. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Wishing a, a, for a peaceful and healthy 2022 for everybody on the Korean Peninsula and everyone looking at the Korean Peninsula. Thank you again, James, Chad and Colin for coming on this show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone, and also special thanks to Arias Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this podcast, and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. If you have any questions, feedback, or guest recommendations, please send them to podcast at nknews.org. Thank you, and listen again next time. (laughs) 